le están desplazando al borito nativo de aquí. Ajá. Con la famosita carta de los 30 días y toma y te tienes que ir. ¿Y ahora para dónde cojo? Y si lo que me cobran allí donde yo puedo no me va a dar con lo que yo me gano. Lo, lo que pasa es que hay que hay unos grandes intereses allí. Y está pasando en Puerto Rico completo. Y vamos a ser este extranjero en nuestra propia patria. Puerto Rico, officially the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, is a U.S. territory in the northeastern Caribbean. This territory has a government composed very similarly to ours, with an executive, judicial, and legislative branch. The big main differences are the exemptions from some aspects of Internal Revenue Code, lack of voting representation, and the ineligibility of Puerto Ricans to vote in presidential elections. It is for these reasons that we must discuss the tax exemption policy in Puerto Rico. Hello, I'm Gabrielle Abram. And I'm Gabby Urdaneta. First, we must go over to what extent has Puerto Rico, uh, Puerto Rico's tax haven status affected native Puerto Ricans socioeconomically. To put it simply, Puerto Rico's tax haven status has in fact negatively impacted native Puerto Ricans. Through our research, we found that this answer can be explored through three different lenses, through the eyes of wealthy mainlanders, through the eyes of legislators, and through the eyes of native Boricuas, or political, economic, and social perspectives. So first, let me take it back to 2008, when Act 73, or the Economic Incentives Act, was passed. This act was meant to promote economic development by providing tax exemptions to businesses. I repeat, only businesses. Then Act 20 was passed in 2012, or the Export Services Act. This sought to attract new residents to the island by providing a total exemption from Puerto Rican income taxes on all passive income after such individuals became bona fide residents. To sum it up, a bona fide resident is someone who is present for at least 183 days on the island of Puerto Rico, does not have a tax home outside of Puerto Rico, and does not have a closer familial connection to the US or another country than to Puerto Rico. Then we also have the Individual Investors Act, otherwise known as Act 22. Now these benefits are available to residents of the island. However, they're only available to uh, eligible individuals, which are bona fide residents that were not bona fide residents in the six year, peri the six year period prior to the enactment of Act 22 in 2012 of January. From 2018 to 2022, eight of the thousands benefiting from the act Gabrielle mentioned have bought at least 28 properties from apartment buildings to old residential homes in Puerto de Tierra, right outside of Old San Juan. Puerto de Tierra means gate of dirt and was once where slaves lived after they were freed because native Boricuas wanted to keep them outside the walls of old San Juan. What was once the Puerto de Tierra Community School has now been bought and is being re renovated and is currently in the process of being turned into an upscale apartment building with a seaside view. The person who bought the school of Puerto de Tierra is also the leading political contributor to a lot of political figures in Puerto Rico, Brian Tentelon. This is just one example of the countless neighborhoods that have been renovated, remodeled, and is currently driving native Boricuas out of their home communities and is now being targeted to mainlanders coming into the island and seeking to live in these beautiful, beautiful cities. And it is for these reasons that we propose as a group that our first solution should be creating a legislation that protects these housing costs from becoming too high and unaffordable. But even before these acts were passed, Puerto Rico was simply not in the position for their legislature to have to pay any higher rent. Puerto Rico's total debt has dramatically increased in the last couple of decades. In 2006, they experienced a dramatic recession that they haven't truly been able to recover from. One of the biggest contributors to this recession was the EB-5 Immigrant Investor Program and Act 20 and Act 2020 and Act 22. These were all deliberate attempts by the Puerto Rican government to attract foreigners to invest in business in Puerto Rico and to eventually improve the land's economy. 
However, the continuous implementation of policies of tax evasion policies in Puerto Rico aren't really benefiting Puerto Ricans themselves, but are in fact benefiting the mainlanders that are coming into the island. This is also more uh, effect, uh, more due to the fact that the poverty rates have been increasing due to recent catastrophes such as Hurricanes Maria and Irma of 2017. As we can see in this chart here, between 2016 and 2017, there has been an increase between 43.5 to 44.4 percent in poverty rates. Not only that, but we must also take into account the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic that impacted economies all over the world, and more so Puerto Rico, because their economy was not prepared for such an effect. And all of these combined with the pressure implemented by foreigners and investors that are coming to the island have contributed to what Gabby said is um, them being pushed out of their homes and eventually off the island. Then there's also the issue of the decreasing amount of jobs that are available on, in Puerto Rico. In 1995, there was a total of recorded more than 150,000 uh, manufacturing jobs, but by 2015, there was less than 70,000 jobs available. And this is also reflected in the labor force participation rate where between 2005 and 2014, we go from 49 to less than 42%. And this lacking source of income contributes to how uh, Puerto Ricans are unable to afford for the, their homes and the, due to the rising housing costs mentioned earlier. Now, Airbnb listings for home, entire home short rentals in Puerto Rico have increased by 32% every year in from 2018 to 2020. And additionally, the median price of homes for sale in San Juan, a popular tourist area, has increased to, to has been listed at $260,000 in June, which is about 42% more than the amount that was listed in June of 2021. Now, the increased poverty rates mentioned before, along with a lacking source of income, have all contributed to uh, why Puerto Ricans would be pushed out of their homes and off of the island. And those homes, as mentioned also before by Gabby, those homes were remodeled and reused to, into something that would attract more foreigners. And as more foreigners come in, more locals would be pushed out. So through our research, we found that one really viable way to fix this issue is to increase government-led loans and business investments. Because by taking government funding and spending it towards constituent-based business investments, we promote economic growth and eventually self-sufficiency. However, after a long period of patience, Puerto Ricans have begun to fight back. There have, be, there have been several peaceful protests where they're, they're simply fighting back against the injustices that these tax evasion policies have um, done to them. And among those would be the Abolish Act 60 movement, which has brought together those who have already been affected and been pushed out of the island due to these tax evasion policies, and those who are currently in the island and are already being affected by it. And this is especially helped through social media. However, US and Puerto Rican governments are not listening to Puerto Rican voices. In this chart here, the mainland uh, the mainlanders usually don't want uh, pu want Puerto Rico to officially become a state of the United States. And this is most likely because that they reap the benefits of Puerto Rico being a colony, of, of Puerto Rico's colony-like status. However, there have been six non-binding, uh, six non-binding referendum, referendums that have been held over the past 50 years debating on whether or not Puerto Rico should pursue, pursue statehood. The latest being in November of 2020, where 52.5% of individuals in Puerto Rico have stated that Puerto Rico should in, in, should in fact become a state. However, this vote was not approved by Congress and has led to several boycotted movements, boycott and political movements in Puerto Rico. And ha that has only confirmed earlier trends rejecting the status quo. And that is why as our third and final solution, we should listen to voting for voices and pursue statehood. So after our research, we found that a possible solution is to protect housing costs through legislation, although government priorities don't align with that vision. We can also increase loans and business investments to benefit native Boricuas, but the government does have limited resources because of their territory status. Or we could pursue statehood to listen to Boricua voices, although currently there is insufficient support from U.S. politicians, making this increasingly difficult. Thank you. Thank you. All right, if you guys would do me a favor, just step close together, uh, and I will have a question for 
we'll go this Gabby before we go to that Gabby. Um, what's a way in which your team's resolution makes you think differently about the research you conducted? Well, I focused on the political aspect and looked at legislation that was enacted. And what Gabrielle made me realize was that there are many ways to solve this issue outside of pure legislation. I was originally seeking an amendment or repealing a certain law, but she made me see that by investing in native Boricuas and helping their housing crisis and their employment status, we could work from the bottom up or the inside out and ensure that we're helping people directly instead of going through legislation, which could be a little bit more difficult. All right, uh, and Gab, if you had another team member, what perspective or limitation could they have reached that would have been a useful contribution to this project? If we had another team member, the other perspective that we were thinking of would be um, the historical ones. As mentioned before, this was a, as mentioned by Gabby before actually, this was a buildup of events and these legislations, these aren't, the, the legislations here aren't the only ones that there are. There are more in the past that have contributed to the par increased poverty rates that I mentioned and the increased, the increasing debt that Puerto Rico is facing. And if we had a historical perspective, we could also get a glimpse of how those have made an impact as well. Though maybe not as much, it would still have an impact on Puerto Rico today. 